Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, back with another video for you in my Patch by Patch series. Getting right into it here, after my 1.1 video I posted just a bit ago. In this one, we'll cover Patch 1.2, which came out in just under a month after release. At this point, most players would still be leveling up, but there was at least one level 60. A troll rogue by the name of Zenith on the Storm Reaver server dinged 60 around December 3rd, just about 10 days after release, and the first one to do it back in the day. And that's doubly impressive, since the servers were probably up for only about half of that time. It's a pretty interesting comparison though. In the re-release, the first 60 ended up being a mage named Jokerd. In just three days this time, using the AoE grinding method, in combination with the now removed layering system. So over three times as fast. A testament to our increased familiarity with the game, as most people close to Jokerd were also mages, as that AoE grinding method is just so efficient. Knowledge and skill weren't the only things that were different though. The class balance in the game as a whole was ever changing from 1.1 to 1.12, so let's get into the thick of it, starting with Maradin. Yes, even dungeons were still being added to the game. There were many more planned in fact. They originally wanted around 50 in total. You may have seen this screenshot before of the dark portal statues in the depths of the Ashara zone. These were used as a placeholder for dungeon entrances during the beta of the game. Here's the old entrance to Skull Immense. Incidentally, with the Ashbringer craze and the player's search for the Outland, the waters of Ashara became one of the focal points. But in the end, it was just one of the many random dungeons cut from the game before release. But anyways, Muradin. Quite an important dungeon, designed for the level 40 to 50-ish range. An interesting thing to note is just the non-linear design. Although a lost art today, this was a staple of vanilla dungeons. Multiple paths, unlockable doors, optional bosses, puzzles. The best examples of this are the Blackrock Depths or the Sunken Temple. And the best word to describe them is Labyrinthine. And your first time running through them, you really felt like Indiana Jones exploring some ancient ruins. Today, for the most part, you're set on this linear path where it's impossible to get lost, especially with the help of dungeon maps. And not to stick on the design too much here, it's also just a victim of the times. Again, back then, during 1.2, the game still wasn't super popular. We'd be around right here with subscribers, so the information available online was limited at best. Today, we have ample choices. Full detailed guides, with screenshots, or even videos. Where to go, where the bosses are, how to kill them. Players would have killed to have this back then, but it does strip you of that wonder of the unknown. I liken it to using strategy guides back in the day. Still, before people really used the internet, with any game, you could also buy a strategy guide which would detail various stages or areas of the game and show you all of the side quests and hidden secrets. I remember as a kid picking up Final Fantasy VII and actually being stressed over what was to come. Am I ready for the next boss? Or maybe I missed a materia? Guides are useful, and with the advent of the internet, they're prolific these days but you do lose a bit of that magic of exploration and the unknown. And it's all thanks to those stupid YouTubers. God, I can't stand those people. You can make the argument that it's all within the player's control, but in the context of dungeons, you're of course grouped up with other members, so what then? Plus, in general, I think games these days are sort of designed to hold your hand and guide you every step of the way. That's why we had waypoints in Skyrim and in Final Fantasy and so on. So, how did I get to all of this from Maradin? Well, I want the series to not just be me reading out patch notes. Just as the game has evolved, so too has everything surrounding it. Design philosophy, the developers, the players, all of it. The goal is to hopefully get you in the right frame of mind of not only what this game was, but what it was at the time. And, in the case of Maradin, you can see this labyrinthine design shine through. There are three entrances total, but all leading to the same dungeon. You have the orange side, the purple side, and inner as players call them. The orange and purple both lead to the final part, which is inner. You can do all of it in one run, but since it's so big, players oftentimes just choose to do parts of it. And again, multiple paths, and there are a few different ways to progress through this place. Luckily, for those looking to farm inner, Blizzard threw him a bone, and they gave that handy teleport. 
And another interesting change here is the holiday update. I can't claim that World of Warcraft was the first to do this. I certainly don't remember this in Star Wars Galaxies, but it's still a rather important thing. MMOs are all about giving you the feeling that you're in this thriving, ever-changing online world, and this is one of the many ways of doing that. Just having these special holiday events for Christmas, Halloween, and as we'll see later on, fishing tournaments. Like I said, I'm not sure that you can say World of Warcraft did it first, but maybe the one to really popularize it. Sticking on the same subject of that thriving online world, something that they were one of the first to do was to have NPCs in the world actually doing stuff. This was described as being one of their major design goals in their 2001 preview of the game, even before the alphas. Before this, the standards of NPCs in games were to sit there endlessly just staring into a wall, which you'll still find in games certainly, but there are also guards patrolling around, dialogue, blacksmiths going to work. Today, this is pretty run-of-the-mill stuff, but back then, it was pretty big. Todd Howard's Radiant AI ripped directly from World of Warcraft. Let's take a look at the other side of the game, our new Radiant AI system. It allows NPCs to have full, 24-7 schedules. These NPCs are not scripted. We give them general goals, and they figure out on their own how to accomplish them. Body's still warm. Looks like there's a killer about. Joking aside though, the first game I really remember doing this was the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, where the townsfolk acted like, well, townsfolk. They had their own schedules, the shops were closed at night while they slept. This was revolutionary, and the World of Warcraft took note of it, bringing it into the MMORPG genre. And next, we have the fact that you can now hide your cloak and helmet in the interface menu. I just wanted to bring this up since it loosely relates to transmog and aesthetics. Again, trying to put you in the frame of mind during the time here, they're more important than people give them credit for. And this is also something that shifted in the current design of the game. Back then, you of course wanted gear for stats, but the looks were also very important. One is just being fashion. There's nothing better than finally completing your class set, and then showing it off to the world. Like, yeah, I cleared the Molten Core, what of it? Gaze upon my wonderful glory. The King of Bananas. That's why I see people just loitering around on the Ironforge Bridge all the time. And the second reason is for actual balance. A perfect example are the Death Grips. These are a set of plate gloves that makes the wearer immune to disarm. So as a warrior in PvP, I know what these look like by heart, and if I see another player wearing them, I know that trying to disarm them is futile. And just in general, seeing a warrior with full tank gear, it's like, okay, this guy's gonna be harder to kill, compared to say someone who looks like this, as this is just a plate PvE DPS set. This is valuable information that's obfuscated with stuff like transmog, which is why I'm personally against it in the re-release. I think it works in the current game and its design, but to have something like this in Classic would be pretty foreign, like a time traveler going back a thousand years. It just wouldn't fit, I think. And another funny change here is that players now give credit for monster kills even if they die. I bring this one up because in the World of Warcraft Diary by John Stats, they describe an old Nomergon run with the developers. It took them hours to get through, and at the final boss, during an intense battle, Chris Metzen died, and he didn't receive credit for the quest to kill Thermoplug and he was super upset. So, it was from this that they decided to make this change. And here we have the monetary value of fish has been reduced, as well as green item drop rates. I have no confirmation, but I imagine that this was done to combat botting in the game. Fishing, of course, being one of the easier activities to bot, so I'm sure that people were starting to work on programs to automate it. So, maybe you can see this as the start of Blizzard's never-ending war against botting in the game. In the re-release, it's rampant as of this video. Oftentimes, you'll find that a questing area you need has these hunters going from mob to mob, repeating the exact same input patterns over and over. The telltale sign is the quick turn, where after looting a mob, they do a really quick 180 and immediately attack. So, it's still an issue today, 15 years later, which is kind of funny. And we also have the usual class balance. Not a whole lot going on in this patch, honestly. I think with the massive change in 1.1, they're still letting things settle. 
An interesting one, I thought, though, is that the Priest's Power Word Shield is only usable on party members now. This gives that weakened soul debuff where you can't use another shield for several seconds. So I imagine this was done because people were getting trolled by low level priests triggering the debuff with crappy shields. And we also have some crowd control effects getting a nerf. This was when they added that random chance for long CC effects to break. Although there were diminishing returns, they would still last for the full duration for the first time. So they're just adding a bit of randomness here. The fear nerf is pretty funny though, because in the re-release, it still seems like it never breaks, no matter how much damage you're taking. But that's about it. Not as huge of a patch as the previous, but it's to be expected. Aside from raid releases, most patches will be of this scope. Lots of balance changes, maybe some dungeons, events, or whatever. Before we sign off here though, let's do our usual forum review, and see what the players thought of the game so far. Many times in this video, I mentioned how the times have changed, as well as everything surrounding the game. One thing that hasn't is complaining. Rest assured, people were just as pissed back then as they are now. Here's a post complaining about the complainers, in fact. Does this mean that I'm complaining about a post complaining about complainers? Hmm. And here we see some level fatigue setting in. As mentioned, people were hitting 60 at this point. But for many, it was a daunting task, and they'd quit long before they reached it. Here we see a player eager for the PvP system, which was still in the works at the time. As of this patch, the only reason to PvP was for the satisfaction of ruining someone's day. It doesn't get any more pure than that. No honor, no rewards, just causing someone to break a keyboard over their knee. That's all I got though. Hopefully you learned some stuff, or at least found it entertaining. Like the video if you liked it, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace. Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.